Hi, everybody. Welcome to Interrupting Racism. My name is Brian Prowitz. I'm the host of this uh, streamcast that we do um, oh, once a week or so, a couple times a month, when we're able to connect up with amazing leaders in the state of Oregon to talk about what's happening in the state and also tackle some social justice issues, have some real talk, and uh, hopefully inspire people to look for the good that's out there. And uh, it's my honor to be the host of this here program. And we're happy that you're along with us both on Facebook and also on our YouTube channel for Interrupting Racism. And uh, we're happy that today we have to bring you from the Medford Ashland area. We want to welcome Senator Jeff Golden, who, uh, like me, has some broadcast background. So we're going to go through. We've got a lot in common, including some time in Ashland. I graduated from Southern Oregon State College back in uh, 1900. And so it's been a while for me, but uh, I'm glad that you found some time to spend with us today here on Interrupting Racism, Senator Golden. Thank you. Really happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me on, Brian. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, we'll get to a couple of things here, but first a little bit of a biography for Senator uh, Golden. Uh, I mean, if I just, should I just embarrass you and just read your Oregon State Legislature bio. I mean, reading it word for word may not be, you know, it probably take a long time, but let's just say highly educated author, uh, politician. I use that gently. I know that's not always, I'm one too, so I know how that feels. Broadcast and editorial journalism um, in his background, organizational consulting. Uh, Senator Golden, how do you describe your current set of responsibilities? Well, I'm a member of the Oregon State Senate, have been for two years, uh, representing uh, the populous part of Southern Oregon, the Medford, Ashland, Phoenix, Talent, Jacksonville area. Uh, and, you know, I keep, I sort of have a journalistic, half journalistic hat on all the time. And uh, most recently, when I was elected, had a PBS show that started in Southern Oregon and went to different markets nationally called Immense Possibilities. I get to plug that, don't I? Yeah. Because all of the episodes are online at immensepossibilities.org about the most exciting, inspiring community ventures uh, uh, that just, you know, everyday people are putting together uh, to try and stoke my hope for the future. So I still have a bit of a hand in there, but I have discovered that despite how it's presented, uh, being a state legislator really is a full-time job. So that's pretty much what I'm doing these days. Despite how it was presented. That's good. I like that. Um, well, uh, stoking hope for the future. I feel like that could be a subtitle for what we're doing here. I, I got so sick and tired of seeing the vitriol on, on social media, which really hasn't stopped, and thought, you know, what can I do to to share some intelligence back into the world. And the ALF network is just about perfect for that. If you don't know people that are watching, the ALF network would be the American Leadership Forum of Oregon. Uh, you can learn more uh, at alforegon.org and I'll put the URL up here shortly. But uh, yeah, stoking hope in our future. And we uh, purposely did not have this interview uh, last week or the week before. I kind of wanted the election to go by and kind of figure out where things were and let it settle a little. I don't know about you. Do you feel a little bit more settled since uh, Saturday night's big announcement? It's really, we're in a really complex time. And I, you know, I be straight out about it. I thought and think that our current president has been enormously damaging to this country. And, uh, and I'm really relieved that he's not going to be president. At the same time, I understand there are millions of people who have supported him, that, that this becomes a very long discussion, but who really feel dispossessed about the changes in this country over the last, you pick it, 5, 10, I would say 30 to 40 years because of historic changes that, um, you know, I think this president found a, f a focus for them to blame um, that's not right, that's not accurate. But the fact is uh, millions of people feel dispossessed and that's not going to change with the changing president. So we've got, you know, a huge challenge ahead to change the structure and economy of the country to be fairer and more accessible to more people. 
you know, people, we, we mention people of color a lot, and that's a, you know, prime uh, segment of who I'm talking about. But I'm also talking about people who aren't of color, you know, who kind of played by the rules for a long time. And in our part of the world, you know, chose um, uh, forest-related work, logging and wood products work. They followed the rules, wanted to do what their grandparents did, and had the world change uh, in pretty fast ways that our president sort of uh, capitalized on when he, with his, you know, make America great again and let's bring back big coal and let's bring back big timber, that I think was a cruel and cynical exploitation of the fears and disappointments that people have. But that, you know, that's my perspective. But the fact remains that that's still here to divide us. And the road to, you know, sort of healing the wounds is not a clear one. So I'm, I both have some relief and some apprehension about what lies ahead. There are some very difficult conversations to have. I mean, you've got a whole bunch of people right now that are still angry. Clearly, uh, at the recording time of this uh, conversation, the, the whole dispute about uh, votes and the president's objections and lawsuits and all that are still brewing on some level. Uh, but already, just for me, I'm already running into uh, places where the conversation uh, is is not easier. It's flipped, I think. And let me give you an example. So um, I've I, I consider myself a conservative Republican, but I've become pretty liberal in a lot of the social issues. So I don't know what that makes me. But and I hate labels, so I don't like that. But. Um, I've been having these conversations with people like you around the big social issues, social justice issues that we see, racial, um, you know, all the all the discussions around equality and, and systemic racism and all those things. Uh, and I have lots and lots of Trump supporting Republican friends and family that are <coughs> now uh, they don't they don't feel better now the the table has turned a little bit uh, and now they're the ones saying the things that the people who voted for Hillary four years ago were saying. So uh, what I'm saying is that it's uh, the conversations are still very big and still very important. And there's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of defensiveness, a lot of anger out there now in that group. I'm just wondering if there are your thoughts on how we get past, I don't know, what, what are the next steps where are those conversations going to be the most fruitful, fruitful? What are you thinking about when it comes to that still very angry conservative set that I know you're going to be dealing with in Salem? Or maybe yeah. you deal with in your own backyard. In your, yeah. In your well, I, have, I have a very mixed district. Um, you know, my main towns are Ashland and Medford. Ashland's very blue. Medford's still very red. So I maybe a little bit of a microcosm of the country. So, of course, um, Brian, you're asking the core question that we're all going to be trying to figure out over time to come. A couple of things are clear to me. One is both of the major parties have failed tens of millions of Americans. And, you know, in the, in the Trump base, you have many former Democrats who feel betrayed. And I, I don't blame them. I think that... Um, Democrats have largely talked a good talk about uh, opportunity and about um, fairness and equity and all of that for white and black and brown people. And it hasn't really materialized. And um, I think, you know, this conversation could go a lot of different directions. But what I, one of the things I'm say, seeing, and I would, like, I would like it not to be a right versus left thing is that um, over the last 30, 40 years, a very, very privileged class of Americans um, have, 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 absorbed, have enjoyed almost all the economic and wealth gain. I mean, the statistics are staggering, whether you go to the fact that Jeff Bezos, uh, in, a, in, a, in one day in the last three months, made $13 billion because of the way the markets are structured that, you know, 1% or one-tenth of 1%, one percent, I'm not going to get this right exactly, uh, that three individuals have the same net work worth as uh, 50% of Americans, that those kinds of things. Now, I grew up at a time 
when we had a healthy capitalist economy where people who worked hard and took risks were rewarded, but it wasn't that insane lopsided kind of thing where you've got, you know, a, a mindlessly wealthy class and you've got tens of millions of Americans who are working full time, two or three jobs, working harder than I work and having to make decisions about putting food on the table and paying the rent. So we've got some structural problems. And I, I think it's a real dead end when we talk about socialism versus capitalism. Which way do we want to go? And that's mostly where the pol political talk tends to go. I don't think it's about that at all. I think you don't have to get very deep in the weeds to understand that there's real advantages to an enterprise system that rewards risk and hard work without getting to that very extreme, you know, lopsidedness that gets then built into our politics through campaign finances and who, who kind of owns politicians, that we can build a consensus that says we would like some of the strengths, you know, the strengths of a so-called free enterprise system. And you can talk about how true that label is. And, you know, the notion that in the richest country of the world, in the world, People who work full, full time shouldn't be in poverty. They should be able to support their families. We can have both, but we have to get away from this cartoon character, you know, really extreme pictures that some of the media kind of promotes. What, you don't want to see Jeff Bezos making $13 billion in a day? You must be against business. You know, we got it. We all of us got to resist and say, well, wait a minute. Let's not simplify this to where we can't find solutions and see whether the richest country in the world, you know, can, can make sure that people willing to work um, have some decent security and there's an upside potential for people to really succeed. You know, I'm, I, I'm looking for more nuanced, less polarized discussions like that. Yeah. Because it feels like in order to find that balance, somebody has to let go of something. And right now it almost feels like, like the capitalists out there would have to let go of something in order for us to, for instance, have uh, a, a more, um, you know, a, a different healthcare system. I, like, I, I struggle with this a little bit on, on the big policy changes that people are demanding through Black Lives Matter, for instance. Uh, and I, and I, I kind of resist the effort to try to figure out a way to change the high policy stuff. And I, I end up settling on the conversation, like, how do I treat somebody who's just sitting across from me? I, I take it down to the micro level, but at the very high policy level, how, how you just talked about trying to break down that socialism versus capitalist model and those conversations. But I feel like in order for there to be great big change, uh, somebody has to let go of something. How do you, how do you get past that? Well, well, most of us have to let go of something. We've got, you know, my sense is that we are at a point in this country where we're kind of careening towards the ed edge of the cliff on a number of levels. I don't think any society maintains itself and sustains very long with the kind of wealth gaps we have now. We're, we're now the most polarized country in the developed world when it comes to wealth and economic opportunity. Um, you know, I'm, I am really concerned with the trends of climate change. I understand there's probably people listening right now who don't agree with me, but for me, the evidence, even if we don't know all the details is pretty clear. So, you know, it's gonna take, you know, all of us to say, what's at stake here? Many of us, you know, if, if we don't have kids and grandkids, we know little people or young people. You know, we, we would like to be part of, uh, you know, a tradition that goes back thousands of years to try to offer our kids and grandkids, hopefully something as good as we inherited from our grandparents and parents, but at least a viable world. Okay, if that's going to happen, what's it going to take? And I think it's going to take some give from all of us able to make some give. And we can talk about some examples of that um, as well. But right now we've gotten so tribal that we're not, we're, it's hard for us to think in that way because we're, we're now so, so hostile and polarized that the sense is more, if we give an inch, 
we're going to lose a mile. You know, we could say, you know, okay, can we look at a, I'll just throw something out, another tax bracket for people making more than a million dollars a year that would help fund some of these things. And if you just approach it on that level, you can have a pretty good conversation about it. But if the attitude from the wealthiest is, well, if I do that, they're going to come after me even harder for more, you're not going to get very far. So that's just one example. Um, and so, and, and I'll go back to what you just said. You said that you're operating on the, how do I treat the person across from the table from me? How do I listen better? If we don't do that as well, it's unlikely we're going to get to the point where people loosen up enough to listen uh, to what's being proposed and not f fight everything out of the fear that it's a slippery slope and they're going to lose everything. Yeah, which is which is what I hear uh, when you talk to elected officials who are loyal to their party or extreme, if you will. Uh, it, it is it is party first and and policy and person second. And I, I think people are sick of that. Uh, I think it's time for some change on that front. Uh, I don't know what that looks like, but I hope it's coming. Well, I think we need some encouragement for leaders and, and political people to question their own party as well. I can tell you in Salem, you know, I'm sort I'm a bit of a, what would the right word be? I, I stray from my herd more than most people do. I'm a bit of a, not, not a, I'm a Democrat and I can safely say not all the Democrats in Salem are thrilled with what I say and what I do, but we are, we're in a system I think where that kind of behavior is pretty dangerous. And as things get more hostile, you know, you don't want to stray from your herd very far because it's it's rough out there. And you kind of, you know, if you have, if you, you're you looking at your own team and saying, you know, maybe we ought to do this differently, that's, that's a, a tough road to hoe right now. So maybe, you know, if people can really value that kind of independence, whether it comes from Republicans or Democrats, Maybe we can make some headways. Yeah. State Senator Jeff Golden is with us here on Interrupting Racism. Um, well, you referred to uh, having those kinds of conversations, and that was the big takeaway for me in ALF. What was your experience like? First of all, what class were you in in ALF, and what was your experience like? How would you describe it? I was in class three. I'm a kind of an old timer. I did my uh, ALF year in uh, 1989. I was the second person from Southern Oregon at the time. It was uh, very, very Portland heavy and it's gotten somewhat less so. And at the time I was a quite a young county commissioner at the time. Um, and, and so what was your big takeaway from that? For instance, did you, um, it did, what, what kind of impact did it have on you uh, politically or personally? I, I'm not sure if I can scrunch that into a brief answer. I think it, it started my understanding that the only way we can get to the kind of conversations we're talking about and the openness to doing things differently and away from the kind of the tribal war is by building relationships. Um, and, you know, I know I, all I have to do is look at my own mental process. I know if someone comes at me and tells me what an idiot I am and, or even more so how I have bad motives, how I'm only interested in, you know, this liberal conspiracy to take advantage of rural people or to tell people exactly what to do. I'm not, I'm not open. You know, I start debating and finding ways that this challenger is wrong. And I don't want, I don't really hear a word they say. But if I have somehow built a relationship where I, I care a bit about him or her, see their decency, see that they're, they want a good world too, I'm more open. And, uh, and I start to listen and maybe I start to question some of my beliefs. So the whole ALF model is based on relationship. And it's really kind of a, in a way, it's a privileged thing because we spend a year, you know, a couple days a month together building relationship. And that's, that's a stretch for a lot of people to do, find that much time and, 
and and room in their lives to do that. But you know, you get to know people. My buddy, and you know, in in our classes, you you get assigned to one person for a special buddy relationship. You know, I I came out of a very environmental kind of um, perspective in Southern Oregon and um, feeling like the the forests in the 1980s were really getting overcut. And my buddy was a a, a woman who, with her husband, owned and ran a, a timber company, Ochico Lumber, in Central Oregon in the in uh, the Crook County area. And she had some really different views about forest management. And I came to respect those views more than I had before and see more nuance. So I, not everybody, I think, is able to take the kind of time it needs to be with different thinking people for two full days a month for a year. But somehow, if we can replicate that, if we can find, you know, make the room and time to get with different, different thinking people, we're going to be ahead on you know, the game. And I, I created something several years ago that I called take a blockhead to lunch month. Uh, May is take a blockhead to lunch. And you, you find people, you think of people in your own lives who you have some regard or good feeling about, but who really feel differently from you about issues, vote differently than you do. And you take them to lunch. You, you know, I affectionately call them a blockhead. And you don't debate. You try to suspend that part of your mind that's always, you know, in debate mode. And you ask them sincere questions about where they're coming from. And you just listen. And the, it's got to be questions. And just because there's a question mark at the end doesn't make it a question. Like how do you, how can you in, in your right mind believe such nonsense? That's not a question. And, and really try to develop your curiosity. Um, I, I try to do that at least once a year, or one month a year, and you pay for the lunch. Um, and that's that's to the good. And we're, we're pushing against these kind of blast furnace media outlets that we all know about that keep trying to make us believe that the guys who think otherwise are enemies. And we, you know, we got to resist that. Yeah. Well, um I'll tell you that uh, Alpha has changed changed my audience and the people that I'm accountable to in a big way, and uh, I think that's a gift. And it's hard to find the person and the environment and the time and the vulnerability and the honesty and the, all the. There's a lot that goes into being able to have a conversation with somebody who, and going into it, you may know that you don't agree with, or there's going to be a point or two that you are going to butt heads about. But man, there is it is there's something else when you spend that time with somebody and you get to know them. And then you realize that all your perceptions or whatever the label is that they bring to the table, when the perceptions don't match the label, stuff starts happening. And uh, uh, I'm sure you've experienced a lot of that as well. So uh, did, did Alf help like shape the things that catch your attention or maybe how you process things? Uh, you, you've had quite a, you've had longer, I'm class 34. I'm only a, a couple of years into my ALF experience. So you've had more time to distill all these things and sort of, you know, make, allow you to become more wise because of the time you've had in there and then your experience in life as well. But, um, does, did, does ALF change the way the things that seem to catch your attention or the way you process things? Boy, I'd like to think all the time I've spent on this has, uh, led to a lot of wisdom, but I'll just, uh, I, I won't argue with you, but I'm in some ways still asking some of the same questions I did way back when. It has made me a bit more aware of other parts of the state. You know, um, we, it's worth saying that ALF is a national organization, but it's based on local and state chapters. I think, I think there are nine chapters or something. And Oregon's is unique in that the founders 30-something years ago, decided to make Oregon a whole statewide chapter. The others around, there's one in Houston, there's one in Sacramento, they're, they're around the country, but they tend to be metropolitan. So like greater Houston has one. And that's not as hard as what Oregon's tried to do. Oregon's has really tried to take on what we call the urban-rural divide, right. which, which has been, you know, a challenge as long as I've been in Oregon, 40 pushing 50 years and is still pretty sharp today. And it really has a lot to do with 
after timber declined, uh, I-5 Oregon, if you will, generally prospered, especially Portland. And if you were away from I-5 and super resource dependent, it's been a lot harder road. And that has fueled a lot of conflict. So I, I give ALF credit in Oregon for trying to do a statewide thing and for going to other communities. And that's all to the good. You know, there's a theory the people who founded ALF said, you know, what we need to do is create in a metropolitan area, in a state, wherever, a network of leaders who spend a year getting on the same page, some of the train, same training and leadership, hearing each other's stories, building those relationships we talked about. And then ongoing, they can lean on each other and reach out to each other with a relatively high trust level and maybe do some great things for their communities or their states. And I think that's a great theory. In Oregon, by and large, it hasn't taken hold. And I think the reason is people are so busy. You have to keep maintaining those relationships. And there's been a lot of effort at that. It, you know, I wouldn't call it a failure because you mentioned there are 700 people or something like that in that network now who've all had this training in classes of 20 at a time. And they do, there is networking. They do reach out and say, you know, I've got this real, this idea that I think would really help in public education. Who, who in the ALF and the networks really engaged in that? And they'll call and they'll reach out and some good things have happened. But um, we haven't built this strong, broad network because people are so busy and there's still effort to figure out how to do that. Um, so, um, I want to talk, uh, maybe one of the ways that we're going to find out, uh, where, how far we've come in the rural urban divide in Oregon might be in wildfire recovery. Um, uh, certainly in your area, you were struck with a massive tragedy there. Uh, what, what's a, uh, what's a snapshot update look like with where the, Phoenix, Medford, Talent, Ashland area is right now in that process? So, you know, it was a catastrophe on a scale that none of us have ever dealt with before. And um, I'm on a body called the um, Wildfire Economic Recovery Council, the WORK. We're all big on acronyms um, of statewide folks trying to figure out how to recover for this. There's there's parallel organizations happening regionally. And, you know, the good news is that it looks like the federal government through FEMA is stepping up in a big way because we can't begin to muster the resources on our own to do this. So we basically are staging this in three phases. One is the emergency response phase, which we're well into. You know, the fires are out. We have this huge um, task that we've never faced before of uh, debris and ash removal, just to give a sense of that, the estimated cost for Oregon just to remove the debris is $186 million. And there's a lot of that, you know, in my part of the one, the fire in Jackson County was primarily in mobile home parks, manufactured home parks with a lot of metals and a lot of asbestos and a lot of toxic Debris. And so far, we've had experts in trying to deal with the most toxic stuff. The next phase is getting the stuff out of the way and getting it landfilled. So that's stage one. Stage two is transitional housing. And we are acquiring as fast as we can temporary units. Um, you know, we're purchasing a lot of recreational vehicles. We're getting some trailers from FEMA. There's uh, some groups who are actually getting a uh, containers, shipping containers, and uh, doing a little refab on them to make make them suitable for uh, dwellings, for housing, for the next, it's hard to say, year to 18 months, and trying to do it fast, because if we don't, and this has already happened, we lose a lot of the people who were burned out, and that includes a lot of our workforce, um, a huge portion of our Latinx community, who just, they got to get on with their lives. And 
quite a few of them. Many of them have moved in with family sort of nearby, but quite a few of them are left. You remember the Paradise Fires three years ago in California. That's three years ago, and 20% estimated of those populations are still in the area and others left the area. So that's that's something we're trying to avoid. And then that phase two feathers into a phase three where we talk about long-term redevelopment and you know adequate residential housing and adequate affordable housing. And as you know, Brian, all of Oregon and, and you know to some degree all of the country has been faced with this huge affordable housing problem as over the last 30 years, prices of just about everything that developers and builders have to deal with has gone up, but wages haven't. So over 30 years, we've seen this gap increase that we haven't been able to deal with. Well, now with this destruction and this disruption, there is an opportunity to deal with that in a big way. Whether the resources are there or not is a whole other question. But And then there are all these puzzles about in this phase two aspect where you try to get people under a livable roof for 12 or 18 months. Do you completely discard that as you move into phase three into permanent housing? That's wasteful. How can you get some of this housing that we need up and, up and ready fast uh, to transition into uh, permanent housing so that we can do this in a cost efficient way? So those are, those are some of the issues. And then of course you pair that with all the disruption of the COVID economic crisis with the job picture changing in a very big way. And we've got a puzzle that's beyond anybody's ability to completely solve where we've got it. We know we have to be agile and sort of course correct as we go. But, um, and we got some smart people working on this, um, but we've never been here before. But I hope that gives you some idea of how we're approaching this. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you throw uh, the number of kids that, uh, are affected not just uh, uh, from an educational standpoint, not just from COVID, but now losing your home and uh, the, the instability for so many people is very intense right now. It's something, uh, I, and I, I spent a lot of time in Ashland back Southern Oregon uh, University days, cut my teeth in radio in Phoenix with uh, Perry Atkinson's family there at KDOV Radio in Phoenix. Yep. So it's been a still, bit still, go, still going strong. So I got, I, I knew Jason uh, well back, uh, quite a few years back. Uh, I should put him on this show. That would be fun too. Yeah, he's got an interesting guest. Yeah. So uh, anyway, a little bit of time in there. I haven't been able to go down there to put it all in my mind because when you when you see the pictures, it's just, it's in the same thing in Glide. I, I still haven't taken the time uh, to just absorb the magnitude of what happened in the Archie Creek fire that we're dealing with. 15 miles up the road from where I'm at right now, too. My point is that uh, uh, then you you throw in education, then you throw in reforestation, you throw in the, the controversy of how to correctly manage the situation from a resource standpoint, the environmental impacts. Um, it, it I do not know, and I had a chance to talk with uh, Senator Lou Frederick here about a couple of weeks ago. I don't know how, how, how can we, how can you, our, our state leaders even comprehend the magnitude of all this and try to find ways around it. It would be daunting. It would be overwhelming to me. What, how do you how do you manage all of those elements here? Well, you you phase it. Like I say, you try and say, you know, where where do we need to be two weeks from now, thirty days from now, ninety days from now, a year from now? You know what what absolutely needs our attention. So at first it was getting people emergency relief. Uh, and so you you try to take it as you can in bite-sized pieces. FEMA has people who have done these kinds of things, not around here, but we have leaned really hard on their expertise, especially in the you know immediate phase one kind of deal. And the other thing, and Brian, this gets back to I'm gonna try, I'm gonna take a little risk here. Um, because it gets into these highly politicized things that get us fighting really fast. But the fact is, I know a lot of people think government is um, 
inefficient and it wastes a lot of money. I, you know, I per, that's a complicated conversation. I, I personally think that's way more true at the federal level than at the state and local level. At the closer to the people, the level of government is the more the more we're watchdogged and have to account for spending. But we are at a point where the financial challenge of rebuilding, and it was it was getting pretty daunting just with COVID, but now with these wildfires is simply beyond our financial means. And you, in, as you look in the last 30 years, and I would say, especially the last 10 or 12 years since the financial crash, crash of 2008, there is a class of people who have really profited, uh, done very, very well, mostly they're in the banking and financial markets. And, you know, I think we have to have a conversation about how they can contribute more than they are now to our rebuilding. To saying, you know, I know the, I, you know, I can imagine people immediately going, this, you know, this is any business, and this guy wants to soak the rich and punish, punish success. You know that old pattern of fight that we've always had. But basically, for a number of reasons, we can't afford the repair that we have to do right now with our current system. So I want to say to the very wealthy and the people who, for whatever reason, have prospered through a time where a majority of people have either suffered or stumbled, how can you step up? You know, some people have done it, you know, the good old fashioned way, worked incredibly hard, had incredibly good ideas. And some people haven't. Some people have been in the right place at the right time. I personally think if you're a hedge fund manager, and you're not risking your own money, but you're spending three hours a day clicking on keyboards, you know, manipulating financial instruments here and there and taking home in the tens of millions, you know, making more in an afternoon than some of our neighbors will make in their lifetime. We need to look at that. And I don't pretend to have all the answers, but but I think we need a serious conversation about how the most fortunate among us can step up in ways that they're doing now and help us more than they have been in recent times. I get how I get how complex that is. I get how people get triggered about that, but I don't know how we can avoid that conversation and step up to the challenges that we have before us now. Yeah, and challenges we're not done with either. I mean, for sure. Direction with COVID right now, don't know where that's going to head. Um, so, but uh, we can't really. I guess, project too much further into the future. We got enough to deal with already, I think. So, uh, well, one of the big, one of the big reasons to have you on and, and to talk with our senior fellows is to find out what, what, what are you doing that uh, you might want to put out there that your ALF network might be able to support? What kind of work are you involved in? Uh, and is there a place where you could direct their attention or their skill set? Well, I think the the linchpin is what we've already touched on, which is how can we lower the temperature and listen to each other better? You know, I've uh, quite a bit of my career has been dedicated to that effort. Um, You know, I'd love to say we're in better shape now as a state and a country than when I, I started getting interested in this about 20 years ago, building common ground finding where we agree, that kind of thing. But we're not, we're not in better shape. So, you know, ALF fellows, partly because of kind of who they are going into the program and partly because of the emphasis on listening and kind of mediation and and positive use of conflict um, are good resources for that. Where from where we are now, just uh, just coming out of an election where there was so much conflict and so much extreme feeling, and we're not we're not out of the woods yet on that. Um, what can we do to nurture, you know, what I like to think of as an Oregon patriotism, where we can um, really prioritize the common good and have rough conversations? And as on an individual basis, push ourselves to listen better and more openly 
not and less of that preparing a rebuttal as you're talking uh, um, than we're used to. You know, we the Alf Senior Network has some of the best people around at that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, that strikes me as the most critical because if we can make progress on that, there's some pretty great ideas out there on the particular issues. What do we do about public education? What do we do about healthcare and transportation and housing? There's smart folks who've thought a lot about all of those, but it's this, you know, partisanship and this tribalism and this, you know, I can't give an inch because you'll take a mile kind of attitude that we've, we've got to crack. We've got to make some progress there. And I know, you know, we've returned to that two or three times in this conversation, but, but it it seems to me like we're just going to be flapping our gums if we can't make progress on that. And is there something you can do in Salem? I mean, is there some place, if there's a place where our, our state leaders could potentially begin to knock down some of those barriers, I think that'd be the, the place to start. And, and I must sound like the most naive Pollyanna uh, anywhere to even say that out loud. But if, if there's a place for that to start, it, you sure hope it could potentially help in the relationships that guys like you have with your mates in Salem. So I've been there two sessions. I'm, I'm a relative newcomer. I was elected in 2018. No, no, no. You need to fix it right now in your yeah. first two years. It's no, 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 no. That's not where I was going. <laughs> um, and we are setting in Salem a pretty, if you pardon my language, crappy model for, for in this area, in good listening, in trying to be flexible. You know, my two sessions have been the two sessions of walkouts that have made the session collapse. And that's, that's a sign of complete failure in the area you're talking about. So, you know, things have been tried. There's a great organization statewide run by the woman who used to run ALF, Robin Teeter, called Healthy Democracy Oregon. I recommend it to people who are interested. Uh, at PSU, there are various programs that uh, for conflict resolution and all this kind of smart kind of wonky stuff. But I am um, I am really thinking this is an area, you, you know the old saying, when the people lead, the leaders will follow. I think this is really an area for that. And that we, we need community leaders and people in every community who are, you know, know each other through Rotary or parent teacher organizations or churches or wherever who have found some kinds of breakthroughs with people they disagree with to, to model it, bring it to, to our attention, and really kind of lay down the law to us, saying, you guys, we elect you to solve problems, and your, um, your, your fighting right now is not getting the job done. So, um, and, and modeling examples, because, you know, there are lots of ways where I think we still can lead. We should lead on this one, but we're not headed in the right direction. And I'm open to all kinds of solutions, but this one in particular is one where I think people in communities and organizations in communities who bring folks together to accomplish stuff, not sit down and say, let's talk about why you voted for who you voted for, I voted for who I voted for, I feel this way about timber. You feel that way. Let's work that out. That I don't think that's the way so much as looking around their communities and saying, what do we need to improve? And then when work, people work together on that, you know, opportunities for our kids, you name it. When they work together on that, that starts to build a relationship. That starts to build the, the, the listening and that starts to build solutions on the larger problems. And I, I, I am sorry to say that's one where right now people can't look very productively to Salem. Well, that's hard work. I mean, I think about just in Roseburg, you know, where, where I'm at, where it's a small town, 25,000 people and getting everybody to agree and pull in the same direction on just about any topic. We're trying to tackle homelessness here, you know, and trying to get, shoot, get 10 people to agree on a way to solve a problem. It's very, very difficult, but, um, maybe you got you got a chance because you got those relationships. You see each other in the market. You got kids in the same schools. 
you know, maybe you belong to Rotary or an organization like it. So you got a shot. Well, um, I appreciate your time. Uh, many of the topics we touched on are exactly what I figured we'd talk about. Uh, I bet you if this was six or eight months ago, we'd be probably talking about George Floyd and uh, COVID and where that was going to go. The, the tone of some of the conversations has shift a little, shifted a little bit. Um, we, one of the, one of the big topics, and I'll just kind of throw this out as a, a point that we can end on and talk about, uh, and this is going to come back to, um, racial equality and the injustices that we've seen and some of the change that is being demanded. Um, and, and if this was six months ago and we were having this conversation, it would be two white guys talking about race and, and somehow that's more valuable or very important. I wouldn't say more valuable how important that is. And the surprise I got from my friends of color throughout the state who said the things that you and I are able to say publicly in support of our friends of color, specifically in the, in the African-American community, so important, so important. And, and that has, because of the election, I think, and COVID, that whole conversation, I think, has taken a little bit of a back seat, but I definitely want to touch on it because it's very important. Uh, what are some of your thoughts on where we're at? Um, and and I, I don't, I don't know. It, it feels too vague to say as a country, maybe as a community, maybe even Southern Oregon. Let's focus on Southern Oregon for half a second, because I'll tell you what stopped me in my tracks was when one of my Alf, Alf uh, class of thirty four uh, friends, who happens to be a woman of color from the Portland area, she said she was afraid to come to Roseburg, like she was taught her whole life not to stop in Roseburg. And I know where those perceptions come from. Some of them are true and some of them have kind of been blown up. But the bottom line is it didn't matter what my opinion on that was. She was scared to come to my town and it was devastating to me. Where are you at on that whole spectrum of trying to make people feel welcome and safe in Southern Oregon communities? Well, I have heard that same remark said about, about my, my community, the Ashland Medford community. And it is, it is hard to hear. You know, I think maybe we you, you've put your finger on the very roughest example of how we're not hearing each other. Because, you know, I think that, you know, what has affected me the most as a white man is hearing people of color in ALF and elsewhere talk without... Um, trying to convince me of anything about their daily experience uh, and their experiences in their lives. Because like almost all or many, many, many white people, I start out with, hey, I'm not racist. I'm not prejudiced. What are you talking to me about? You know, you're talking about slavery. That was 150 years ago. And, you know, let me tell you all the, you know, what a, what a tolerant, great guy I am about this. And that's really missing the point. And we are not in an era, by and large, with guys in robes burning crosses on, on, um, on lawns and, you know, railing against people of color. There's a little of that that happens. But if, if you're thinking that's what racism is, you are missing the picture. And, you know, what, what I think what it takes is people who, um, people, uh, white people, trying to hear and trying to imagine what it's like, because it still happens, to need to tell your kid, you know, if you get stopped or have interaction with a police officer, you need to be completely friendly and obedient. No attitude. Because I have two kids and I've never had to give them that talk. That is that is something. That goes deep and that's important. There are, there are many examples. Yeah. Then on the other side... You know, I'm hoping that people of color who are tired of waiting, you know, think they've heard of, especially people my age have heard for decades about how white people are trying and we're moving towards equity that and are saying enough, we're tired of waiting. Um, I think they need, they need to, in my view, to sit back and listen and understand that there are plenty of white people in this country whose lives have, and, and financial security and hopes for the future, have gotten um, a lot bleaker 
in the last 20 or 30 years because of very large historic changes. And when those people, those white people, hear the word white privilege, and you have white privilege, uh, friend, they are going, what the F are you thinking about that I'm privileged? Let me tell you, you know, I can't make my mortgage payment. I used to be fine. So when they hear, you know, lots and lots and lots about the plight of people of color, their minds are closed. And they, so that we need, we're going to need a little bit of understanding across the board. And I do understand that people of color hear that and some of them get angry and say, I am tired of hearing what white people need. So this is a this is a really rough issue, but we, you know we don't need to agree with each other, but we need to recognize something human in one another, and how we're hearing all this. And this might sound a little kumbaya, touchy feely, but it's going to take that, um, and it's going to take some, you know, letting go let letting go of what we think we know and hearing better than we used to. And it's going to take spending time with people we have not spent time with before. And it's not going to be easy. Letting go of the things we think we know and listening to each other. Boy, that's that's really good. Um, that's good advice. I like that. I'm going to tell you my favorite bumper sticker, which I, I see occasionally down here. It says, don't believe everything you think. I used to object to that so hard. I used to just think that was the weirdest bunch of goofy psycho babble I ever heard. And then I was at Shore Acres and I wasn't paying attention and I tripped over a hedge. And the whole time I was falling, I thought to myself, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. And then I hit the bark and I realized that's exactly it. <laughs> you tell yourself you're fine, you tell yourself you're fine. And or that's the way I process that anyway. Anyway, I felt like I understood that bumper sticker in that moment because you can tell yourself a lot of stuff. Well, for me, it, for me, it goes to, you know, I think a lot of things. I have some really strong opinions, but it's really helpful to remember that I don't know everything. And there are some other perspectives out there that are worth my serious attention. And so my, I better go a little easy on my belief as I'm thinking all these things. That was a much more philosophical response to the, the saying than my story of falling. Well, you, but falling. your hedge was, your hedge was more connected to the real world. <laughs> uh, the other thought uh, there on listening and, and that kind of thing is, I think there is incredible power. If you admit to yourself, instead of saying, I'm, I, I know a lot of stuff. I'm not racist. I got a lot of friends. Maybe I am the problem. Maybe I am part of the problem. Maybe I am a little bit racist. Maybe I do have some biases that are built in there. Things really started to open up for me when I crossed that line and, and started to realize that. And uh, so I hope that, uh, and, I, and I truly. And, and, and hopefully if we, it's, it's all about giving, giving ourselves and others a little bit of slack because we are carrying around a history of hundreds of years hundreds of years of ways of thinking, the ways our parents taught us, uh, media messages. We're carrying this huge sack of, of stuff behind us. And um, we need, we need a, little, a little mercy from each other to, to remember that. Yeah, no doubt. Well, hopefully my, my true hope and prayer for uh, this conversation is that more people get to see it and that, that uh, maybe there's some perspective in here that you haven't thought of before if you're watching uh, this. Also, you can go back and watch previous episodes of Interrupting Racism. Uh, Al Jubitz was on our program. We also talked to Pam uh, Noor from Medford uh, and Anthony Valise from Woodburn came on the program as well in the past. So do check that out. We also want to send you over to our official t-shirt website, speakupwithus.com. We've got t-shirts there that uh, have some attitude. Jeff, I'm going to send you one as That's well. That's great. We'll with pride. That's great. We've got all kinds of different slogans on there. Um, and the uh, revenue from those shirts is going to go to the Black United Fund of Oregon. Also, we do take live comments on the program as well. We've had a few comments from 
some folks on uh, Facebook, mostly just thanking us for being here and, and put some of our stuff out there for other people to see. And uh, this is extremely satisfying conversation for me, Senator Golden, and I hope for you as well. Um, stick on the line here for a second, because I definitely want to chat with you a little bit before you sign off. So, uh, But we would want to send people also over to uh, alforegon.org. You heard Senator Golden and I talk quite a bit about ALF, the American Leadership Forum, and it's definitely worth a look. So, and if I, if I, if I, two things, Brian. One is, let me throw in the website immensepossibilities.org. It's not a financial thing. It's okay. all giveaway, but that has 160 half-hour episodes of unbelievably great things people are doing all over the Northwest. And, uh, and this was a very rich conversation for me, too. I'm really, really thank you for inviting me on. Well, it's a pleasure. And I, I have a funny feeling if I when I listen to uh, Immense Possibilities, uh, it might be good that you and I aren't in the same town. I think you and I might, uh, we'd probably wreak a little havoc. <laughs> so thanks again for your time. Thank you to everybody who watched this uh, program today. You can check us out on Facebook and also on YouTube and uh, stop by uh, speakupwithus.com org and uh, pick up a t-shirt so thanks again hope you have a great day and we'll talk to you again soon